Hi everyone, and welcome to the lecture on semantic case roles. Uh, when, to get into talking about semantic case roles, first we're going to talk a bit about the distinction between uh, grammar and meaning. So what we've talked about so far are different types of grammatical relations that hold between verbs and arguments. So we've talked about uh, things like subjects and objects. That's a relationship between the verb and the noun that it's interacting with. However, there are different types of semantic relations that hold between verbs and arguments as well. So uh, semantic relations are going to be more meaning-based than, gram than grammar-based. So grammar and meaning are, to a large extent, actually separate and independent from each other. Semantic case roles are things that I started to mention in talking about subjects and objects. So when I talked about subjects having a nominative case and objects having a accusative case, that is an example of a semantic case role. So it tells us kind of the role of a noun phrase in a sentence. So it tells us that the noun phrase is the one performing the action or the noun phrase is the one having the action performed on it. So semantic case roles are relationships that hold between verbs and arguments that are separated, separated from the grammatical relations. There's a, typically a fairly small and abstract set of these case roles. So um, th basically the meanings can be a bit abstract, but there usually aren't a lot of them in a given language. <clears throat> so uh, one semantic case role that is very common is that of an agent. So an agent is basically the one who instigates an activity or an event. So for example, Sarah ran the marathon. Sarah is doing this um, of her own free will, and she's the one who's kind of instigating the running. Janet is the one who's listening to Mozart, or Ahmed is the one who caught the fish. A patient is going to be the one that actually undergoes a change of state as a result of the verb's activity. So Sergio wrote a letter. The letter underwent the change of state from being unwritten to written. Or I washed the dog. The dog went from being unclean to clean. You woke the baby. The baby went from being asleep to awake. So the patient is basically going to be the one undergoing the change of state. In English, these match up to subject and object. In other languages, that might not necessarily be true. So um, another type of role is that of a theme. So a theme is one who undergoes motion or is kind of located somewhere. So his car rolled down the hill. The car is rolling down the hill. In English, this is the subject. However, it's not going to be an agent because the car is not the one instigating the rolling down the hill. Sharon lives in France. She's not really instigating living in France. She's just located there. Um, he passed the soup to Franklin. Uh, the soup is the direct object, uh, just like a patient might be. But the soup is not really undergoing a change of state. It is just undergoing motion. There's also a grammatical role not a grammatical role, sorry, a semantic role of experiencer. So an experiencer is someone who just experiences a physical or emotional state. So Shelley heard someone shouting. She wasn't uh, actively trying to hear. Um, she just experienced uh, hearing the shouting. Or if Brad felt depressed, uh, Brad experienced feeling depressed. Or if he surprises me, I experienced being surprised. So a recipient is going to be uh, an entity that actually receives a physical object. So this will typically correspond in English to an indirect object. So I gave the money to Patrick. I received, or Patrick received the money. The museum was donated to the university. Uh, the university received the museum. She wrote a letter to me. I received a letter. An instrument is another role to look at. So this is uh, an entity that's used to perform an action. So this is going to be, in English, typically an oblique. 
but she cut it with a bread knife. A bread knife was used to perform the action. It didn't receive anything. It didn't uh, undergo a change of state. It just was the thing that she used to cut the bread. Uh, Javier covered his son with a blanket. The blanket is the thing that covered Javier's son, uh, but it didn't actually perform any um, action on its own. Javier used it to perform the action. But the blanket wasn't the one performing the action. So a location is going to be a static spatial location, so not one that's moving or anything like that. So they met at the coffee shop. The coffee shop is in one place. She spent the day at the beach, again, a single place, or he is in town for the holidays. So basically the action, the meeting is done at the coffee shop. Spending the day is done at the beach. In town is done, in town is where he is for the holidays. So um, basically these are a location is when we have a single location for the action of the sentence. So the location is in contrast to a source or a goal where we have action occurring in multiple places. So the source is a beginning of motion trajectory. So basically we have, he dropped the ball from the roof. The roof, rather than a location, is a source. Uh, this action takes place in multiple places, but um, the roof is where he started. Or if he drives from Texas to Arkansas, uh, from Texas, Texas is the source of the motion because he is driving, but it's not just in Texas, it's in multiple places, but it starts in Texas. So. A goal is kind of the opposite of that. It's the end point of a motion trajectory. So if he fell to the ground, uh, the ground is where the falling ended, not necessarily where it started. These birds migrate to South America. That's where the migration ends. He drove from Texas to Arkansas. That's where the driving ends. Apollo 13 never reached the moon. That's where the um, motion would, in theory, end. However, we do have negation. so. Um, this is where the lack of motion ended or didn't end. Yeah. Um, so this one is a little weird to think about, but that is kind of the end point of what the potential, potential motion trajectory was. <clears throat> so we also have a benefactive. This is when we have someone who an action is performed for. So we can say, sing this one for Ella, or he bought flowers for his girlfriend. They haven't actually received the flowers or a song yet necessarily, but they are the person the action was performed for. We have temporal, which is a lot like a location. However, it has to do with time rather than place. So we got to the restaurant at seven. Seven is a location in time. So that's what we're calling a temporal. The rally will be on Tuesday. Tuesday is a location in time. So temporal is really a lot like location, except it has to do with time rather than space. So semantic case roles, all those things we just looked at, and grammatical relations are independent. So we can have, for example, um, I'll go back a couple slides here. Um, let's see. Okay, so for example, looking at theme, his car is the subject, but it is also a theme. The soup is a direct object, but it is also a theme. So um, like that slide I just backed up from said, grammatical uh, relation and semantic role are independent. So just because we have something that has a certain grammatical relation doesn't mean it will have a certain uh, semantic role. Okay, so I went back a little too far there. Okay, here we go. So, um, what I'd like you to do here, if you want to do this slide as a potential uh, part of the quiz or as a potential extra credit, 
is for each of these sentences, label the semantic case roles of each subject. So what's the role of Fred? What's the role of he? What's the role of Olivia? What's the role of Rain? So um, basically, label the semantic case role of the subject in each of these sentences. And this is another potential quiz or extra credit question. What I'd like you to do here is to um, say which, uh, which of these things are true of the sentence. So John reached the airport after 8 o'clock. Is the airport an oblique and a location, an oblique and a goal, an object and a location, or an object and a goal? OK. So that is the end of looking at uh, grammatical relations versus semantic roles. In this next uh, section, we'll be covering what's called constructions.